Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this press conference. If we've been too subtle with the branding, uh, you're joining the first press conference of the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum in Davos 2016. And it is a very special press conference um, because the question we're trying to answer today is how can we prepare a vaccine for Ebola? How can we be better prepared for the next outbreak? And uh, it's special in the sense that we're joined uh, by Gavi today, and whenever we're asked at the forum, what is actually the impact you're having? Are you more than a talking shop? We are always happy to mention Gavi, which was uh, born, I can say, 15 years ago here at the World Economic Forum in Davos, and uh, has, has done fantastic things. Just to uh, give you a couple of numbers, in the 15 years, um, Gavi has vaccinated 500 million people in over 70 countries. Let, let, just let that number uh, settle in. Um, so uh, very pleased uh, to, to have this uh, press conference. And without further ado, um, I'm happy to introduce uh, today's, today's panel to you. On my immediate left is Seth Berkeley, who's heading Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. Um, right in the middle is uh, Julie Gerberding, who's joining us from MSD, or as it's known in the US, Merck. Um, she's the Vice President for Strategic Communications, Global Public Policy, and Population Health. Next to her, we're joined uh, by uh, Ngozi uh, Okonyo Iviala, who is the uh, Chair of the Board of Gavi. So thank you for joining us today. And last but not least, we're joined by Professor Jeremy Farrar, who is the Director of the Wellcome Trust um, and completes this panel wonderfully. Um, Jeremy, um, uh, sorry, Seth. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll start off with you. So um, the, the question for the Ebola uh, epidemic that I want to ask you is, why was no vaccine available uh, when this happened? And, um, and also, if you could elaborate a little bit, what is your partnership with Merck uh, or MSD outside the US? Um, please. So um, Ebola is a disease that's been known now for more than 40 years. And there's been lots of outbreaks, but they've been in the poorest countries in small numbers. And as a result, there is a complete market failure. There's no commercial market for such a vaccine. Um, I suppose I can say luckily, but um, during the anthrax outbreaks in the U.S., some investments were made because they thought Ebola might be a bioterrorism weapon. And those were not completed. Uh, those uh, vaccines were put in mothballs. But when this very large outbreak occurred, um, all of a sudden, those uh, vaccines were pulled out, plus new technologies that were there. And um, it's amazing. And I have to hand it to the pharmaceutical sector, because the acceleration of this was done in record time. Normally, we take 10 years to do a vaccine. And um, uh, as you saw here, we went into an efficacy trial and finished it in uh, just a few years. <clears throat> the, um, uh, the partnership with Merck is uh, really about trying to make sure that in this interim, until we have a licensed product, which of course is the critical outcome we want, um, that vaccine is available if there's another outbreak. So the agreement is, and it's an advanced purchase commitment against licensed product at the end, three components connected to this advanced purchase commitment. The first is that um, they should submit a emergency use authorization listing with WHO. That's a regulatory authority that would allow the vaccine to be used um, in the case of another emergency declared by, by uh, WHO. Second, that they would produce 300,000 doses of vaccine and have those doses available in case there was an emergency. These are investigational doses, obviously. And then third, that, that they would make sure to submit a full regulatory regulatory application. Um, uh, lastly, about this, it's, it's very important, obviously, for the world to have this vaccine, which is the only one that had efficacy trials and therefore is, is the most promising available. But also, the science around this vaccine is critical because any other product that is being considered, since this has human data as well as animal data and all the great work that the Merck scientists usually do, it will frame, you know, all vaccines. And so it's really important to uh, do that. Um, I just want to lastly acknowledge uh, Gail Smith, who's here, the USAID administrator. The partnership around Gavi is quite broad. It includes you know, all of the major donor countries, the recipient countries, all the pharmaceutical companies. And you know, we're all committed to make this work and to try to make sure our vaccine is available so something like this doesn't happen again. Thank you, Seth. Julie, let me, let me put you on the spot. Um, how, how close, how far away are we from, from having an Ebola vaccine? Well, first of all, I am 
very happy to be here to celebrate the 15th birthday of Gavi because I didn't Six, realize. 16th, 16th, 16th. Okay, thank Last you. Last year was 16th. Um, it's a, if that's all that the World Economic Forum did, it's, it's a miracle. So congratulations on your 16th birthday. Sweet 16, I would say. Um, the, the serious nature of the problem that had to be addressed, the Ebola outbreak, was a wake-up call to a lot of people. I think we had gotten complacent about Ebola as something that was usually a small problem in rural areas and could be fairly rapidly quenched. But the scale and speed of what was really a firestorm of Ebola in Western Africa really uh, reminded us once again that Mother Nature is the best terrorist and that we do need to take much more seriously our ability to prepare in advance but also to respond when something like this occurs. So uh, the truth is this is an unprecedented speed uh, to develop a vaccine product. The fact that we have submitted the uh, necessary paperwork to the WHO and they've accepted our paperwork for review for the uh, emergency use assessment uh, process happened faster than it has for any single other product. So in that sense, um, the partnerships that grew up between industry, uh, Gavi, the WHO, the governments of the affected countries, USAID, all of the various players, CDC, NIH, uh, is really an unprecedented example of global collaboration. And this speed would not have happened if we hadn't had that capability. And I will say that while there are many actors in that process, the fact that Gavi was there at the center and had experience in understanding what is necessary to bring a life-saving vaccine quickly to people who need it really was kind of the glue that kept the partnership together. So I thank Gavi for that, for that leadership. Um, from, a, from a Merck, or as it's known here in Europe, MSD perspective, we uh, we need to get this vaccine licensed. And so our highest priority right now is to continue to assemble the science, the safety data, the immunogenicity data, the efficacy data, and have full licensure, both so that we can obtain a WHO recommendation and meet the requirements for the advanced purchase agreement, but also so that we can use this product more broadly, even in advance of an emergency, so that where it's appropriate, we could have pre-existing protection, for example, among health workers or others who might be at risk. And that is, first and foremost, our, our leading priority. We are also uh, certainly ramping up to be able to make sure that we provide you those 300,000 doses um, in, in a few months so that if there is a, a recrudescence of the outbreak, um, that we have doses of vaccine available and ready to roll when people need them. And we know now how to use this in at least one way with the ring vaccination scheme so that we can hopefully rapidly quench subsequent outbreaks before they reach the size and scale that we experienced. And then the last thing um, that we've committed to as a company is that when we have a licensed product, we will make it available for the people in the poorest countries at the lowest possible not-for-profit price. And that means that we intend to be able to provide wherever people need it a vaccine that is affordable and that the cost of the vaccine will not be a barrier to the kind of public health protection every everybody deserves. Thank you, Julie. Ngozi, um, in your native country in Nigeria, um, which is one of the most populous uh, countries on earth, out of the 11,000 people uh, roughly we lost to Ebola, I understand there were only eight people who died of Ebola. What, was, what, was the, what were the measures you took? What was the success story, if you will, uh, uh, in Nigeria? What happened there? Well, thank you very much. Um, let me also use this occasion to say this is my first uh, major public engagement as the Gavi uh, board chair. And I'm really proud to be here to welcome Gail and, as well. And. Um, say that uh, one of the reasons that I'm excited to be chair of this board is because of the kind of public-private partnership that we see Gavi involved in. The fact that you can really use um, innovative ideas and uh, financing mechanisms to bring the public and private sector together to deliver on, 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 on an issue that is so important as the Ebola pandemic. You know that the Afri whole of Africa was very, very much impacted by this particularly West Africa. And as you say, my country, Nigeria, we were lucky uh, because we had a strong health system in place um, that we had used 
to deal with uh, polio, we were able to deploy that to be able to manage this uh, pandemic, and only eight people died. But let me say that 11,300 people were killed uh, in, in West Africa, 28,500 infected, and there are at least 17,000 survivors who are dealing with the complications and the social st st stigma that is attached uh, to this. Uh, so there's the loss of lives, the fear, uh, you know, that we all experienced about this pandemic, uh, and just the sheer uh, terror of it. Um, that's on the human side. You also, uh, as a former finance minister, also paid a lot of attention to the economic side of it. And um, you will remember that the, for Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, uh, the, the um, World Bank estimated uh, losses, you know, in, in a couple of, of a couple of billion dollars um, in these countries. Uh, the UN Development Program said that for West Africa as, as a whole, it might even exceed three billion dollars. So uh, we, this is just a lesson that uh, if we don't pay attention and prepare ahead for these kinds of pandemics, it's not only the loss of human life, but can devastate a whole region economically. So to, to conclude, I'm really proud. I think this is the kind of thing we need to do, the, using the advanced purchase commitment, preparing ahead. And I want to also thank the pharmaceutical industry for uh, what they are doing with us. Thank you. Jeremy, let me ask you. Um, the, the Wellcome Trust, your, your lifeblood is, is, is R&D. Um, why, why was the process so difficult to get to the vaccine? And, and, and what are the steps that you think should, should be taken to improve this for future cases? Yeah, I think it, it, it's very important to put Ebola in context. Um, since, the, since 2003 or 2004, these are not rare events. So, um, in fact, I may be one of the few people in the world that's been involved and seen patients through SARS, through bird flu, through the pandemic of 2009, influenza. Um, we have MERS-CoV in the Middle East at the moment, which is continuing to circulate. We have Zika in South and Central America. I mean, um, they, these are regular events. And actually, if you ask yourself for any of those, we actually, we actually don't until today um, have a clear uh, vaccine available for any of those. So in some ways we're using 19th century interventions um, when we come to have these epidemics. And I think in future we need to see an Ebola um, and what Merck and Gavi have done in relation to this, um, I think needs to set the precedent that we absolutely have to commit ourselves for those epidemics that we know about, that we have vaccines that have been into man in the inter-epidemic period, such that when we come into an epidemic, which can be very explosive, can disrupt society, as we've heard, and impact on both health and econ econ economics, that we have those vaccines ready to go, and they can go at a moment's notice. And I think that's what we've all got to commit ourselves to, for the, for the knowns, the chikungunyas, the, the zikas, the mers, the sars, uh, and then we have to also think about the unknowns that we can't yet predict. HIV, remember, was an epidemic that, that started and has devastated the world, um, and there are a number of those that we don't yet know about that we need to be prepared for. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, maybe, maybe one question to, to all of you quickly. Um, so you know the forum is always keen to, to have a multi-stakeholder engagement, and that was mentioned that, that Gavi is, is so, so successful in doing that. We have about 40-something heads of state and government here. If you had one wish to, to these uh, uh, gentlemen and ladies here representing the public sector, in a nutshell, what would it be? No start, sir. Please. I, I think it's uh, what Jeremy said is to take this seriously. I noticed on the risk uh, register for this year at the Global Economic Forum, uh, infectious disease is not in the top 10, and that's because it's not top of mind right now. But when this happens, and if you look at what HIV has done to the world, and of course, if a flu pandemic occurred, a really severe one like the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic, we could have 50 to 100 million deaths. And the World Bank has said that the cost of that could be over a trillion dollars. So. We need to make sure that everybody has this top of mind and then that the resources and the political will is there to create the systems like Jeremy has talked about. I, I think we're all probably going to answer the question the same way, and that really 
is from the framework of leadership commitment. I too have gone through SARS, monkeypox, uh, West Nile, and so on and so forth, and I can tell you that what happens when a government sees an emerging problem, there's a very rapid response and in a nonpartisan way people kick in and do the right thing, but as soon as the problem goes away, so does the investment and the level of interest, and we've got to get global leaders to stay the course. We don't necessarily need citizens to be in a constant state of alarm about emerging infectious diseases, but we do need the political leadership to keep this front and center on the agenda so that we can get out of this kind of herky-jerky funding process and get into a situation where we are truly prepared to manage these inevitable outbreaks. Thank you. Well, I just have maybe two very precise messages. One is no one is safe. Uh, the world is so small now that I would want all the leaders to pay attention. You cannot say I'm at this end of the world or the other end, so it won't affect me. Whatever breaks out these days can affect anyone, so it's important to pay attention. The second is, in addition to the human dimension, remember the catastrophic financial and economic losses that could emerge, and that can really damage uh, the economy in a way that uh, has leaders probably don't think about. I mean, you know, thinking through the bull and what it did to really undermine the economy of the con three countries that were most affected should be a wake-up call to every leader. I think the only comment I would make is that it is true this is a so-called market failure, but we've got to see this as public health, and, and that is the responsibility of all of us. Um, Governments, USAID, DFID, uh, the other governments around the world need to, as they are doing, uh, continue to support this. This is public health. Industry has to be a partner from the start. And it also shows, and today shows this again, the importance of global organizations that bring us all together. With, you know, Gavi has played a critical role in moving this vaccine forward. Um, and if we don't have those global organizations where countries come together for the common good, um, sometimes we get cynical about those organizations. I think they remain absolutely critical to the future of public health. Thank you very much. Um, we have a couple of minutes for questions from the floor. If I could uh, have an indication. Yes, can we get a microphone? If you could state your name and organization, please. Yes, my name is Isabel Sacco. I work for the Spanish news agency, EFE. Hey, could you please remind us where, in what country this uh, vaccine was used? Uh, during this last <laughs> epidemic, and uh, how many people were vaccinated in these uh, trials that were, what happened there. I heard last week from a uh, WHO official that this vaccine had 90% of uh, eff um, efficacy. And could you please confirm this? Uh, I think the uh, published data available about the trial, which are really the only efficacy data that we can speak to at this point in time, uh, demonstrated 100% efficacy in the Lancet report that came out at the end of July of 2015. Of course, there are more data that have been assembled since that point in time, and the final efficacy submission to the regulatory authorities is still in progress. Um, it, Good science takes time, and getting all of the data together, including data from ongoing trials, is still a work in progress. It's going as fast as I think we can expect it to go, given the um, timeline that we've been operating under. But we, we don't want to make any claims about the established efficacy until we have the science. But it, but it has been, it, it was used extensively, the, the study was done in Guinea. But studies have also un been undertaken, and people within Sierra Leone and in Liberia have received this vaccine. Also, of course, in the United States, in Germany, in Gabon, in Kenya. I mean, this vaccine has now increasingly in more people. And as uh, Julie says, that safety data will is, is all being gathered, and that's the critical bit that adds to the efficacy data that you know about. I think that also speaks to Seth's point earlier that um, this is the first vaccine to have uh, information about efficacy, but it helps understand additional vaccines that may emerge and helps it create the standards for evaluation. So it's not only helpful in getting a vaccine available for emergency use, but it's also helpful in expanding the whole repertoire of what we know and need to know about future and uh, even uh, more advanced vaccines. 
I just want to, I just want to re also reiterate um, Seth's point earlier that, that to do this in the confines of an epidemic, which is terrifying to be part of, is chaotic and is a crisis. To have got through and got efficacy data on a vaccine is an enormous, amazing tribute to the people in Guinea, to Merck, to MSF, to WHO, and DFID and, and Norway and, and Wellcome Trust, who, who funded that. I think it is a remarkable achievement which really does need to be celebrated. I would have to go back and check. I hate to say it, but I think it, off the top of my head, is it 4,000? It's between four and 6,000. I can give you the number, the exact number afterwards if you want, but it's between four and 6,000 in that study. In that study, and then, and then well over 10,000 if you look That's at right. all of the use of the product in different yeah. settings and, and tests. Yeah. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? No, all questions have been answered. Wonderful. Thank you very much to a fantastic panel. Um, it's, been, it's been encouraging to hear uh, the, about the great work that's being done there. And thank you for the great partnership. Um, thank you for watching. Thank you, thank you for moderating. <laughs>